care to react in some way how you felt about this or that or whatever's on your mind? I was impressed by, first by uh, uh, showing up people's defenses against their own prejudices. And I think it wasn't Omaha, Nebraska, it was Baldwin or any other community in the United States. I don't have any doubt about it. The tragedy was that the pastor who had all this education, seminary and so forth, was so naive about the way the congregation was going to be. I think that the minister was not naive and that he was able to listen to the Negroes. I don't know. I can't, I can't go along with this thing of uh, waiting for the timing and uh, cultivating the people and waiting until they're in the right humor and this, that, and the other. I think you've got to, uh, some people have to do what they have to do. I don't know if I'd call him a hero. I think he was doing his job. And I say, God bless him for bringing it up in the first place. He does pin these people to the wall, and he doesn't uh, let them maintain their liberal posture of saying, I love everybody. I think that his leaving probably did more to bring about change in that church than anything else could have happened to it. If we have to wait for that film to awaken people, it's too late, or practically too late. And to see it up in a movie is one thing. To talk with a Negro and really know his problem, then you can commit yourself. CBS News presents... A Time for Building, an exploration of the impact and effects of a unique church-sponsored documentary. Here is CBS News correspondent Charles Kuralt. You know how church films are. They show people doing things right, and they are shown to the youth groups uh, after supper on Sunday night. Well, the reaction you've just seen was obviously to an entirely different kind of church-sponsored film. It's a film that has stirred people to their bones since it was shown for the first time a few months ago on the National Educational Television Network and as it has been seen around the country. The title of this unique film is A Time for Burning and its impact has been so great that what we're going to do today is uh, show you a bit of the film and then report on how and why it was made and on its impact in this country and on its implications for church members and for everybody else. The man who made it is seated next to me, the co-director with Barbara Connell, William C. Jersey, an independent film producer. Also here to join in the discussion is Robert E. A. Lee of Lutheran Film Associates, who commissioned the film, and Mr. Lee is its executive producer. And the Reverend Dr. Philip A. Johnson, a man who knows something about the subject the film deals with, a Lutheran church, since he is himself a Lutheran minister and is associate executive secretary of the World Council of Churches. Bill Jersey, how'd you happen to make this movie? Well, I was asked to make it. Bob Lee of Lutheran Film Associates came to me and said, would you like to make a film that deals with the church's response to racial tension? And I told him that I was glad that he didn't want me to do a film about the church's answer to racial tension, since unless he had some inside information I didn't have, I didn't know of any answer that the church had that seemed to really be working. And uh, so we explored the possibility of how we would do this and where we would go. I'd like to say that um, when we came to build Jersey, we had already spent about two years trying to uh, collect research information about what the church's posture was in the areas of racial tension. We'd come up with a lot of stories, story ideas, some of which we thought might make a good dramatized film. And Bill Jersey came and said, well, it would be much more effective if we could film something as it's happening rather than to recreate it afterwards. And this is what we were persuaded to do. And I'd like to say, Probably that one thing that I think is important, that one of the reasons I was willing to do it is that Bob and his associates made it very clear that when they said they were willing to do it, they meant just that, that they said to me, you know, I could be free to explore it. But you uh, didn't get quite the uh, film you had in mind, I suppose. We didn't know quite what we had in mind, but uh, I suppose it was a gesture of faith, uh, which uh, may not be unreasonable for a church organization to, to have. Uh, but no, we, we had actually hoped for a different kind of film. And there was a real question as to, in the process of it, as the story was developing, whether or not this was indeed a film we could use. Well, we'll see why uh, those uh, doubts crept in in a moment. This is a film about uh, a minister who uh, got himself into a lot of trouble by uh, trying to lead his church into a, an experiment in race relations. Uh, you know the answer to this question, I suppose, Dr. Johnson. Is this the kind of thing churches are doing, or are more ministers, uh, as time goes on, likely to get themselves into the kind of trouble the Reverend William Youngdahl got himself into? Well, I think the church all over the world, Charles, is, is very much interested in conflicts and tensions between people and groups of people. 
certainly in the United States, we've seen the church taking a much more realistic look at what this conflict means in terms of their basic Christian faith. And fortunately, all over the country, uh, this type of discussion is going on and people are seeking creative solutions. They feel that the church has got to have an answer uh, or what good is its message if it can't help people to live together creatively? Well, though it will crush Bill Jersey to suggest it, there are probably people who haven't seen this film yet <laughs> and who don't know quite what we're talking about. So now we're going to show it to you, an incident, uh, or, or a part of it, an incident in the life of the Augustana Lutheran Church of Omaha, Nebraska, a kind of synopsis of the film that has so many people talking and we may hope thinking, a time for burning. Christian community has a great opportunity today to really help change the climate. You know the myth that the white man is inherently superior to the black man? This myth has plagued us for such a long time. To take these myths and to listen to the facts and perhaps to let go of them. For you and I know that it was not the white man and it was not the white church, but it was the Negro. It was the Negro Church which initiated this struggle in this quest for justice and love among men. <coughs> what kind of attitudes are you sharing with others, your friends, your children, when it comes to race relations? What is your race relations vocabulary? I've heard so many Christians use the word nigger. By what we say, by how we act, we teach. We witness. The few particulars that make Omaha different from New York are just incidental. Mm -hmm. The problem exists because white people think they're better than black people and they want to oppress us and they want us to allow ourselves to be oppressed. This is the ba I agree with you uh, perfectly. This is the basic problem. Then what do you that want white people uh, think they're better What's than I can others? Do? I can't solve the problem. You guys pull the strings at closed schools. You guys draw the boundaries that keep our kids restricted to the ghetto. You guys write up the sh restrictive covenants that keep us out of houses. So it's up to you to talk to your brothers and your sisters and persuade them that they have a responsibility. We've assumed ours for over 400 years, and we're tired of this kind of stuff now. We're not going to suffer patiently anymore. No more turning the other cheek, no more blessing our enemies, no more praying for those who despitefully use us. We're going to show you that we've learned the lessons you've taught us, we've studied your history, and you did not take over this country by singing, we shall overcome. You did not gain control of the world like you have it now by dealing fairly with a man and keeping your word. You're treaty breakers, you're liars, you're thieves, you rape entire continents and races of people. Then you wonder why these very people don't have any confidence or trust in you. Your religion means nothing. Your law is a farce and we see it every day. You demonstrated it in Alabama. And I can say you because you're part of the whole system. You profit from it. In fact, you make your living from it. You couldn't walk around and talk to people, stand up in your pulpit on Sunday and preach nice little songs and say, now we're going to give thanks to the Lord for he is good and old Jesus be among us. As far as we're concerned, your Jesus is contaminated, just like everything else you tried to force upon us is contaminated. Mm -hmm. I think the problem is so bad that we can have no understanding at all. You think it's gotten to the point where there can never be that reconciliation? Right? No. You talk about justice, and it means one thing to you, and we talk about it, it means something else to us. Mm -hmm. And it'll always be that way. Mm -hmm. And I'd, I'd like you to know I have a terrible feeling against preachers, because I think you guys are the ones who are largely responsible for the problem in the first place. 
and you can accept it or not any way you choose. And for you, this may be an excursion, you know, in what, across what, the what line. About the person that wants to listen, I genuinely feel that I want to listen. Well, if you listen and try to do something, you get kicked out of your church. See, that's, that's the way your people are. I would see um, an interracial exchange of couples uh, as uh, something sponsored or encouraged by our social ministry committee to actually promote better human relations. If 10 couples would uh, take the time and the trouble to go into a Negro home which you, with a sister church oh, using Hope so Luther. Sacrificing to attack um, them, to start with this problem that uh, hasn't been introduced apparently too well in our congregation. Uh, we're not running around proselyting Negro members. We simply want the understanding because of the fact they are in our community. Mm -hmm. well, we want to get away away together as a people. How far away are they, Bill? Uh, not over two blocks, are they? Three blocks, we have Negro families living. But I feel there are so many areas that we could work in. There, there are a tremendous number of places. And why pick this one to start out with? Uh, uh, in a hundred years, we, the social ministry committee has done nothing, and uh, now we start out with the most controversial issue we could. Well, Ray, there are many other things we could look for and find to do, but is there anything more important, any problem more crucial right now? Two uh, board members said this will split the church wide open, and now you're, you're asking me, Am I afraid to present this to the to the council? You're, you're speaking of my church. You know? I'm convinced that, that the ministry of reconciliation that we've talked so long about that takes place so seldom in the church can only take place if people learn that they can they can take different sides of the issue and still forgive one another. And love but one now one. we're talking about let's gamble now, unprepared as, as the congregation That's is, right. and take a gamble on this. That's right. right. We have discussed this as a committee a number of times, and you've reinforced our thinking. And yet, we're suggesting, proposing this to the, uh, to the board without this education. You're asking for a pretty tough decision, and I just didn't put it off. Uh, I'm not going to give you a chance to discuss it anymore. I'm simply going to ask you how you vote. All in favor say aye. Aye. Okay, so tomorrow night at the council meeting, we'll see what kind of reaction we get. Why, why be so revolutionary and, and upheaval and, and let's, let's take, uh, take one step at a time? You th uh, do you think that this would be so, uh, this would be so revolutionary and so uh, repugnant to them that we'd lose some people? The mere fact that on a voluntary basis we would say ten couples, let's say. They are greatly concerned people. about it. They, they, they figure and feel that this church might become integrated, and like Bob said, the exodus will be right out of here. They don't, they don't see why we should go and, and keep harping on this idea of civil rights uh, continually. And they're looking for a little let up instead of continued agitation. That's what I've heard. I'm sure that we're all aware of the touchiness of this situation. Uh, boy, uh, I belong to this church about as long as anybody here. And I realize that we can involve ourselves with, but I also think that it's for the good of the church or I would never be involved in it. I have to admit that uh, it took them until 1220 last night as a committee to convince me that this congregation could meet the challenge. And I'm rather uh, embarrassed now that I didn't have more faith than I expressed last night. I think there has to be a more general approach to this thing first. Now, I don't know exactly what that approach should be, but uh, uh, I may be clear off the uh, If we do not start now as a church, the world is going to pass us by on the biggest issue of our lifetime. And I perhaps am being over dramatic when I suggest, where were the people of Germany when the issue of the Jews came up? Where was the church, both Catholic and Lutheran? 
How did they answer it? And Walt, you say, let's take a step at a time. This is the smallest step we know, we know of. Dialogue, talking with one another, understanding. Let's not look back on history and say, the church had nothing to do when the integration problem was around. I have a little more liberal attitude towards this thing, although I can't say that I'm completely swung around to it. I mean, I have some reservations. My concern is the reaction of the congregation, how they're going to take this thing. I mean, that's my real concern. There's a church that we're thinking about celebrating its 100th anniversary, and we're wondering if it's going to hold together through such a trial as 10 members visiting into the homes of 10 members of other churches that happen to be colored. A uh, hundred years of preaching, where has it gone? Where has it gone? Well, it's going to be real interesting to see, I tell you. That is, in its essence, act one of A Time for Burning. From that uh, provocative beginning, Bill, what developed? Well, obviously a great deal developed. We filmed about 35 hours, about 70,000 feet of film, all kinds of reactions, interactions between groups, between the individuals you saw in the earlier part of film, council members, lay members, the minister himself, the Negro barber, Ernie Chambers. Uh, but one of the events which seemed to trigger uh, much reaction in the congregation was when uh, the high school teacher asked, took his group of high school students to one of the Negro churches that was going to participate in these interracial visits. And then the Negro students returned the visit, came back to Augustana, and there was some reaction in the church. And more and more people began to say, uh, in various meetings, that perhaps this was not the right time. Perhaps we should slow down. Perhaps it would be better to wait. And uh, the pastor, of course, felt that it was almost too late already. And he said this. And pressure began to build up, and there was dialogue back and forth until ultimately the minister was asked to resign. He was urged to resign. Little did I dream one week ago that I would resign as pastor of Augustana Lutheran Church. I was told that a group of members wanted a change of pastor. They indicated that this was not a case of liking or disliking the pastor. The word mismatch was used. I was told that people were staying away from church because they do not want to hear what I am saying. The conclusion is that the gospel as they conceive it was not being preached. As I resign as pastor of Augustana, let me confess again my faith in a God who calls men to be in a company of the committed, that our obedience is to the Christ who stands as always in the hectic confusion of the marketplaces of the world. Where was I backing Bill Youngdahl? We were told, Ted and I, that if we suggest this, we're going to split this church wide open simply because we're asking Lutherans to meet Lutherans in their homes. Now, you didn't tell us not to do it. It was on, the, on and we, we were left with wrestling with this, Ted and I, and we didn't have the gumption to follow through. I have but understood this problem two short weeks. Two weeks, I am just such an infant that I, I, I know nothing other than the urgency. All right, that is now you day. see the urgency, Ray. Now it behooves you to re remember it took you, I don't know how old you are, so many years to get to this point. Other people have not mm -hmm. reached this point. They are not going to get to it overnight. They're not going there, to get to it. There isn't many more nights right. left. The what way if I look that night would have come before you changed then? Let me, let me ask you, what is my position right here? For example, this Missouri Lutheran thing came in the house the other day. They, quote, they start out by quoting Martin Luther, here I stand, that he takes a stand. And then it goes on talking, in the experience of every child of God, there comes a time when the, you must take the one alone stand against the, the stand the world has taken. Where are you going to meet this? You're going to meet it on the college campus, you're going to meet it on the streets, on the factory, and guess where else? You're going to meet it in your church. And what must you do? You must take the stand. Absolutely. All right, now what do I, where do I go from here? 
Well, films end, but life, of course, goes on. And uh, what I want to know is uh, what happened next? Uh, what, uh, for example, happened to the minister? Well, uh, Pastor Youngdahl went, took another church, accepted a call to Berkeley, California, where he's now pastor of a church in Berkeley. And maybe an even uh, more interesting question is, what happened to the congregation uh, after his resignation? That was, what, what was their reaction? Well, I think perhaps it would be interesting to know the reaction when they saw the film. We took the film out to Omaha, uh, as we had told them the congregation we would do before we began filming, and showed it to them. And we were concerned, of course, that we had, in cutting from 70,000 or 35 hours of film down to one hour film, we were concerned that we had distilled the truth, quote, out of it, that we had not interposed our own prejudices. And uh, so we kind of waited uh, and wondered what the reaction would be. And I think there were a number of interesting reactions. Uh, I was terribly pleased, in particular, in one reaction, a man who in the film had repeatedly said, it's not the right time, it's not the right time. We didn't see that section in the film. He kept saying, it's not the right time. When he saw the film, he laughed at himself, he says. He saw the foolishness of this kind of rationalization. The Negro barber, Ernie Chambers, when he saw the film, he said, well, he thought it was, a, it was a good film, but he thought his part in it was a little weak. A little weak? A little weak. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Well, of course, he was one of the, he was the very strongest uh, character in the whole documentary. I think we have to appreciate what a group like this went through in, in um, allowing themselves to, um, to uh, share their, their concerns and their fears and their hopes uh, before an audience like this. Uh, we found, of course, that we got magnificent cooperation and we realized we had a trust uh, on their part to uh, try to convey the, the essential nature of this. Uh, some, I think, were, were quietly puzzled. Uh, our hope is, and I believe the hope um, of the people that we've talked to in Omaha, is that uh, this is, uh, is going to ultimately be a strengthening thing uh, not only in that particular congregation, but in that community. Uh, besides which, we certainly hope that the uh, influence can be a lot broader. Well, I was out in Omaha a couple of <coughs> weeks ago, and uh, this was for a Lutheran Jewish Institute, and talked to a good number of the people, including the present pastor of the church. And he was quite encouraged that uh, these people had faced their problem, they had uh, gotten over it, and were ready to take some constructive steps. One of the things, of course, is that uh, uh, in, in condensing and editing a film like this, and uh, there was as much time spent in editing, um, I'm sure, as, as in filming it, that um, th there has to be a certain um, idea relationship of scenes rather than trying to tell a story of that church in chronological order. And this gave some uh, difficulty to some persons, and uh, yet we felt that the, the idea relationship is the important thing here. Well, this is a film that has uh, obviously made a lot of people look into themselves and ask themselves questions. When you come right down to it, did it make the members of that church look into themselves and ask themselves questions? Well, as I said, there was one particular man, very definitely, and he was a man who had been subject to the potential embarrassment of having his rationalizing appear up on a screen before a thousand people in an auditorium in Omaha. Uh, but. We don't know, of course, how many people, how they reacted, but we do know that uh, people did react and did as look a, inside themselves. As a, a real layman, you know, uh, it has always seemed to me that church members are kind of reticent about involving themselves in community affairs the way these uh, people were. Uh, everybody else is involving himself uh, up to the neck these days. Why have churches hung back the way they have? Are they just conservative outfits that don't want to get involved? Well, I'm not sure I'd accept all of your premises here. <laughs> uh, and I, I don't really think that churches are necessarily more conservative than, than other aspects of our society. You could make a good case, I suppose, for the integration of the bartenders' union before the integration of some churches, but um, I'm not quite sure that this would be true. Let me, let me say this, that a, that a Protestant church in particular is more than a religious fellowship. It's a, it's a definite sociological unit where people have social relationships. And uh, this is what makes some of these people very reluctant to cross a racial barrier. Uh, what their faith might tell them is right. Their training in terms of um, 
being Americans of, of uh, limited transcultural contacts uh, tells them, well, we better go slow on this. Because it isn't only a matter of sitting next to somebody in church. It's also a matter of being to working together in organizations, of being on committees together, of sharing uh, social life completely. And so when a church does make a decision to integrate, or when this happens, it seems to me it's, it's a very significant decision because it means a much larger area of life than, than simply church on Sunday. Yes, but that's uh, implying that most church members look at the church as a, as a building, as a social institution, yes. uh, rather than as a force for action in the community. One of the things that we had as a premise for our making this kind of film was to, to try to <coughs> explore uh, in this situation of crisis or tension just what the Christian church is. And uh, that's why, uh, one of the reasons why Omaha was selected as a, as a site, rather than to going to a church, and there are many of them, who have successfully integrated. Uh, uh, Dr. Johnson's church is one notable example that he did his book about. But we thought that to find this as it's happening, as a church is confronted with a situation of need, that perhaps to be shaken out of this might uh, reveal uh, exactly the nature of the church as a not just a club fellowship but as uh, as the body of Christ at work in the world in the community and Omaha seemed to be a good place to try to discover this happening uh, you mentioned uh, Dr. Johnson's experiences uh, he's the author of a book uh, titled call me neighbor call me friend about uh, his experiences with uh, race relations at, at his church in Chicago uh, what uh, would you say, as a man who's been through it, about the minister in this film? Well, far be it for me to uh, make any judgments about how another man would handle a situation, because you can't really put yourself into another person's situation. I uh, happen to know the minister of, that was in the film and have the highest respect for his ability and integrity. Uh, all I know is that it was somewhat different in our situation than it was in his. I, I think that his um, basic strength was in taking a position and standing for it. Uh, it is unfortunate that there were not enough lay people in that congregation at the time who shared this conviction and were willing to stand by him and uh, to uh, make a, a really constructive contribution in the situation. Uh, I'm sure that our uh, church on the south side of Chicago would not have been able to uh, even survive uh, in a racially uh, split and a very violently changing community if it hadn't been for some Christian laymen who really felt that there isn't anything else that a Christian church can do but to minister to people where they are and as they are and to be the church in the situation no matter who the people around were. In uh, praising this film of uh, the television critic of the New York Times, Jack Gould, uh, uh, felt it necessary uh, to add that it was a film about the prevalence of discrimination in what should be an inviolate island of compassion and brotherhood, the church. Is the church uh, moving in that direction uh, these days? Is this a, a film about something more than just Omaha, but a film about all the rest of us? Well, I think this film is about every church and, and every Christian, really, in the country or, or in the world. Uh, there is a little uh, quality in human character which uh, means that we don't live up to all the potential and uh, as the uh, minister said after he preached the very same sermon for four Sundays in a row and he was reproached about this, well I'll start on a different sermon when you start doing something about this one. Yes. There is a kind of a spiritual and cultural lag you see. The, uh, the church however I think is alert to the implications now of civil rights, of race relations, above all, of demonstrating to the world the kind of a fellowship that crosses national and racial and cultural and class lines. Because if it isn't this, it, it isn't the church at all. Uh, uh, people to see themselves, Bill, I suppose you've probably uh, moved this process forward uh, in this country. Um, as you go about the country watching the reaction of people, uh, do you find that they're identifying uh, as, as we did in my house with the people in the film? I think they do and one of the reasons why I feel that they do and it's kind of going back to what you asked uh, Bob Lee before was why we chose Omaha 
is that Barb and I wanted in this film not merely to deal with race, but to deal with how people struggle with their own fears and with their own doubts. So that we hoped that we would, we would do the kind of film which was not just uh, race pro or con, but rather the substance of who we are, how we kid one another, how we tell lies to one another, and how we struggle with our own doubts and with our own fears. And so I think the, the reason I feel we've gotten a larger identification than one might have with a film on race is that I think we have, we have exposed some of the fundamental human characteristics. And it's these fundamental human characteristics, this fundamental fear of the new, fear of change, fear of, of, of losing what we have a vested interest in and what we want so much to preserve. I think it's on this level that, uh, at least this is on the level in which I would hope that people re respond, not merely in the very limited level uh, or the limited aspect of race. Well, as a matter of fact, Bill, um, I heard a professor of psychiatry say that he thought that it would have a great deal of use in schools of this kind so that uh, the students could see actually what does make people tick and how they act in such a situation like this. What we're saying here seems to suggest that uh, the reactions uh, to this film have been almost as interesting as the film itself. Bill Jersey is uh, just back from a trip around the country filming reactions to the film and we'll see those reactions now. It is, I think, for one thing, pretty good for a churchy movie. It is, I suppose, intended, I don't know, but I suppose intended to be also a movie about the racial crisis. I don't think that it's about that really at all, in a, in a deep sense, in, a, in any uh, profound sense. I think it's uh, much more serious as a documentary about apostasy and the, uh, the forms that apostasy uh, takes. On the other hand, it's terribly dangerous because it tends to make heroes of some of those guys, some of those laymen who change their points of view a little bit, tends very much to make a hero of the pastor. What the hell did he do? I think that you have to take this minister for where he was. He's in Omaha, Nebraska, not New York City. He's in a situation where this church has never, these people have never been confronted with any issue. He is deciding to act where he can act. And what he happened to stand for wasn't as radical as what I would want, but he made his stand. And therefore, in that sense, he's a hero, in the sense that he took his stand and he followed and he did not back out. Now, this seems to me to be the, uh, the only thing we can ask of this man that that be presented as heroic and thereby further appease their complacency. That's what I'm concerned about. I, I sing in the church choir and I do come to the women's morning seminar, but I really, I, I feel like I've got to stay home. Besides, we, we go out so often to these type of things at night. We just don't have the time to do this. <laughs> <laughs> I mean... <laughs> well, we, I think we see the problem. We know it's there, but we lack the guts to take the first step. And we profess ignorance. We don't know where to turn. We have to import the problem. We can always find excuses. But I think it's a question of lacking the guts. No one even says, I don't want the Negroes in the church. But they always say, people feel, you know. Other people are not quite ready. You know, it's never, never themselves. I lack the guts. <laughs> I happen to be uh, one of the ministers and the staff here. And... Uh, I'll be very frank, I will never try to get a resolution through a congregational meeting which will involve uh, uh, all of the feelings of all of the people in a large body. To ask why a, a, a fish is not a bird is, uh, uh, you know, let a fish act like a fish can act and let it swim in the water that it can swim in. And if it can bear children that can go out and do a job, let them do it. Let's bring into existence small militant groups that can go in and act as goon squads most anywhere and get something done in social action. But let's not necessarily act, uh, ask that a, a local congregation uh, move in mass in a specific social area. I just don't think that it can be done. Of all the people in the film, a fear got to me in that film more than anything else. The fear that there are a lot of Ernie's. The fear that there are a lot of yes, Ernie's. Yes, and, and, and that I can, can no longer be complacent because the Ernie's are beginning to multiply and they're not going to let me be complacent. Yeah, he rubbed me the wrong way. And yet when you see the Ernie's and wonder how many there are, 
can we as a church or as a, uh, a country, as a country, uh, just be this complacent? Well, they've been patient about as long as they're going to be patient. Jackson may have come a long way in 13 years and so may have a lot of other places, but when you consider where they should be, the, the gain is, is so minute as to be almost unnoticeable. Yeah. I don't think that you settle issues by getting down on your knees and praying. I think you, you settle issues it? by doing something <laughs> about them. You, I'm oh, yeah, saying that you've got to back up prayers with actions. I do. God I helps do. those who help themselves. So. Well, at some time or other, we have all been all of those people. When the audience was viewing the film, um, uh, uh, you could always hear a ripple of laughter every time a typical argument would, would come up. This laughter was what you do when you see yourself. It, it, it may very this well be. Not, that, this was not ridiculed for these people. Well, this was identifying with them. Well, I, I can understand this, that. This but laughter yeah. was, I've got a friend like this. I've said the same thing. That, these are us. That's, that's, the, that's, the, exact, that's the exact point that, that I'm making That wasn't unkind about. laugh. No, I don't think it was we recognized. Don't think. And uh, I think part of, the, of our identification with it is that uh, we can remember times in the past when we backed away from problems like this. And we're afraid in the future that we'll come across problems like this, and we still do not know, and we still are not uh, so dedicated that we will know that we'll, we will be able to uh, have some bravery, show some guts. I mean, you just never are prepared to change your attitudes. Something forces you to change. But, but you can't just do it a little and a little and a little. You've got to face the issue once and for all and, and, and come to terms with it. Negroes in America are going to become takers. You know why? You can't, you can't show me any group of people in any period of history where the dominant group came to them and says, look, baby, you know, we've mistreated you for 100 years. Here are your civil rights. And we want you to know that we're really sorry about it. And, uh, you know, we're going to straighten out everything, and you're going to be a human being under the law and in the sight of God. It doesn't happen that way. You know how it happens? It happens with bloodshed. It happens with uh, political maneuvering. It happens with pressure. It happens with demonstrations. When I go to church, I like to see a black man to my right and a black man to my left. Well, this is your opinion, mister. It is not mine. It is not mine. The Christianity is making the biggest downfall of the Negroes in the United States today. It's not going to work. Not gonna work. Look, the church is too late. They missed it. The barber, the barber put it in, in so many words. He told the whole story, and those people, the, this, they will not accept it, and they won't believe the fact that they are prejudiced, bigoted, and they don't like colored people because their skin is black. They don't That's believe all. that they're prejudiced. That's all. Swinging, baby. Like, yeah. Yeah. The church has never taken a stand on the war and peace, never taken a stand on slavery, never taken a stand on the black-white issue generally. The church is a facade in our society. You talk about these things, but nothing's ever done about it. <laughs> I'm squirming in my chair, first of all. <laughs> I'm planning a sermon on Sunday. Uh, <laughs> next. <laughs> um. I can imagine... Uh that quite a lot of people, uh, after seeing A Time for Burning, have been squirming in their chairs. What about uh, the indictment of the Negro barber in the original film and the Negroes in Newark in this film, that the church is just a facade, that it uh, doesn't really mean to change uh, race relations for the better? Well, it's certainly true that the churches have passed many resolutions, and I think the resolutions in general are all on the side of the angels. Uh, and the man in the reaction shot here was quite right, saying that, that unless it really gets down to people, it doesn't mean anything. But the resolutions are kind of like a flag that the church or the denomination runs up to show where its stand is. Uh, this doesn't move the troops out of the foxholes. And here uh, is where laymen are so important, and particularly laymen who are willing to get acquainted with Negroes, who are willing to take the first steps to establish relationships which are broken or which have never been established. One of the interesting things to me is um, in a reaction situation or a discussion after this film has been shown, that you, you realize that, that people are reacting emotionally to it. 
they are involved and identifying with it. And it's our conviction, uh, based on this and what others told us as part of our research for this, that if you're ever going to get people to change their attitudes, then you must somehow hook them emotionally. That uh, pure intellectual uh, data is not going to change attitudes. Therefore, we hope that, uh, that perhaps uh, this is what has been lacking in the past. We could stand off and say, well, it's not us. Perhaps this confronts us with the question, maybe it is us. That uh, nervous uh, laughter of recognition that yes. the lady in Jackson, Mississippi was talking about. Yes. There's a correlation here, I think, in terms of the integration of school districts where uh, a study was made. The amount of intellectual preparation of a community did not seem to affect basically the success or lack of success of the integration of the school district. But it was the people who had the power in the community taking a stand and then sticking to it firmly and the amount of intellectual preparation was of less importance than this business of, of simply having somebody out there who was willing to do something. Moving the troops out of the foxholes. Well, um, in, in the case of uh, the church about which the film was made in the first place, have any troops moved out of the foxholes in the uh, months since the film was made? We've been getting an awful lot of mail on this. Of course, uh, after the, um, the uh, film was shown nationwide twice on uh, national educational television, uh, we got a lot of reaction, which suggested that a lot of people were, were thinking about it and discussing it. And um, in, in a number of instances, uh, actually wanting to take some steps, asking, what can we do? Uh, perhaps we should come back and make another film on, on showing them the steps they can take. This may be just a softening up process. I think, though, Charles, we would be naive to give the impression that uh, we have altered significantly attitudes and values of people. I think in much of the reactions we just finished seeing, you see a liberal cop-out. The conservative cop-out may be it isn't the right time. Uh, let's do it another way, an easier way. But so much of this was, a, was the same kind of cop-out. It was saying, well, the church is wrong. The church should do it. Let the church take care of it. It's this constantly uh, attributing to, to someone else uh, the job of, of getting change. And the thing with, with Ray is that at a point in the film, uh, in the filmmaking, I should say, uh, Ray began saying, I'm afraid. Uh, don't get my church involved. And then at a point in the sequence we did see, uh, he said, well, the church must become involved. Well, that was one thing for Ray to say the church must become involved. But at a point during the filmmaking, Ray met Ernie Chambers, the Negro barber. And it was that encounter, it was the personal encounter with another human being that changed Ray, as well as, of course, uh, Pastor Young Dole's resignation. But it was the personal encounter, not as long as we're talking about abstracts, about what they should do or this institution should do. Until the individual, until I am willing to say what I can do, we're going to continue with all this pious dialogue and get nowhere. Well, Bill, you're quite right, but don't downgrade your achievement. I mean, you did get, you did confront people with the situation. Uh, this is one of the beauties of film or television that people can involve with what get involved with what they see, and I think there are a lot of people that are really shaken, and, and they're not just copying out. They do want to know what to do, and I think are committing themselves to constructive steps that must be decided by each individual and by his church or whatever other unit he's a part of in his own community. And I think another thing that uh, is important is the reaction of the establishment itself. Uh, if I may use that generalization for the church, you find those who, who feel perhaps this isn't good public relations. On the other hand, you find top church leaders who are saying that if, if this film is used properly, it could change the course of the church in the next 20 years. That may be certainly an exaggeration, but it does suggest that people at the top echelons, as well as the troops, are giving this some serious thought. I wanted to ask you about this. Um, you suggested that there was a little bit of doubt about the film that Bill Jersey finally brought back. You had no way of anticipating that it would be this kind of film. Um, what kind of arguments went on in the uh, inner circles of the Lutheran Film Associates before you decided to put this thing out? Well, first of all, there was a good deal of argument and discussion necessary before we would trust somebody like Bill <laughs> to go out and shoot a film without a script. It was the first time this had been done in the uh, sanctuary of the church. But having uh, committed ourselves to this, we had to look at it at the point where it seemed as if our 
positive story that we wanted, the success story that we had hoped would come out of this, was not happening because of the uh, incident precipitated through the pastor's resignation primarily. The question then was, do we still have a film? And here the film sold itself to our people who looked at it and said, we have something here that's so real and genuine that we must go ahead and do it. And that says something about the, about the church with all its failures, I think, Charles, that, that here was a group of people that were willing to put their product, in effect, on the line, to recognize it as being imperfect, but to show at the same time that they were willing to use this as part of the curative process. Because whether it's an individual or an institution, there's going to be no cure until people are, are willing to face the facts, the situation as it really is. If you had done nothing else, you know, but uh, show Ray, the man who uh, initially was opposed to this idea, actually capture on film, as a man who's had something to do with films myself, I compliment you on this, actually show on film his subtle change, and then to see him finally become the man arguing strongest for the action. That uh, is something that uh, ought to make all church members think, I believe. I think it's uh, the character of Ray watching this change that took place that, that most people take away from them, and it's, uh, it's uh, Ray they, they most admire, as, as I think we all should. Yeah, I think that's true, because I think uh, the encouraging thing to me to see what happened in Ray was that what we're saying is that it isn't a matter of a whole new body of information. You know, if somehow or other we can get all the data, we can prove that uh, uh, Negroes are not going to marry my sister, or we can, we can completely re-educate everybody. But rather, that here was a man who, through his faith, in the presence of his fear, if you remember uh, in the end of the film, I think even in this edited sequence, when they say to Ray, what have you done? He said, what me? I'm scared to death. What Ray was saying is if we wait until we're fully confident, and if we wait until the plans are all perfect to move, we're never going to get anywhere. It's the time to say, well, in the presence of my fear, I would at least attempt to act. And Ray is still acting and still searching. Yes. I talked to him a couple of weeks ago, and uh, oh, he's a great guy. He says, well, now, where can we move next? What can we do from here on? And well, happily through the film, some of where we did go, in spite of the fact that I did mention the fact that I felt there was some, some copping out. Uh, we are finding in places that we went that there were individuals who were able to somehow or other vicariously go through what Ray went through and who were able to say themselves, mm. in the presence of my fear and doubt, I too will act. That's the uh, interesting question, of course. What action uh, this film uh, leads to and the people who see it is a lot of uh, talk, but has there been any action? Well, the answer is yes, and at least one community, uh, members of a Lutheran church, after seeing this film, decided they didn't want their church to be just a social institution anymore. They wanted it to be a source of action. And uh, they decided uh, that it was a time for building. And uh, my lack of courage sometimes, and it seems almost a hopeless task uh, to first to convince my own church and my own fellow Methodists that something must be done. Now, the concern about uh, causing trouble is so great that uh, in the long run, nothing gets done. I, I, could, I could probably make a big explosion so far as uh, Seaford is concerned. Uh, and, and perhaps get fired, uh, asked to resign. But my question, too, is what would I accomplish? But I think what we are trying to say here tonight is that the church should exercise a stronger leadership role in this whole question, that, that ministers and rabbis should not be fearful of what their congregants are going to do to them. But I think that, again, the, the first thing that has to happen uh, in, in our situation is to get people together to talk and to get to know one another. Uh, to break down some of the myths, the barriers, um, so that uh, people are, are, are stirred uh, to action, to stand up. I feel very strongly that uh, there needs to be a confrontation of, uh, of people in Seaford uh, 
uh, so that as even developed here tonight, uh, there is talk and discussion uh, long enough so that people really begin to see uh, what's underneath. And uh, I think the first thing that I would do uh, is to show the film. I feel that uh, as a congregation, uh, we have an issue uh, set before us in our world today. And uh, the film uh, of another Lutheran congregation, uh, I think, as a way of speaking to us, not as something quite foreign to us, uh, but a situation in which perhaps we could see ourselves. Do uh, you believe that we here should attempt the same thing as the film? What do you think would happen in our Redeemer? I would think that we would have some, maybe not a sharp split, but we would certainly have some words. I just wonder how many would really like to come and visit us, associate with us. Why can't people just go out if they want to invite a Negro, invite a Negro, or whoever they want to invite, just invite them. Why make it such an issue? I don't know one. I don't know one yeah, to just, invite. No, but I mean, even if we have to meet each other, I think we, we aren't going forward because we just don't know how. That, that I, I think really we need help. Yes. We need help in getting together, really even if that, that getting together at first is, is, is artificial. They clan together with their own little group, and they won't talk to the white people in there. We try to talk to them, but they don't want to talk to us. So it's a two-way street. They may be perfectly willing. Maybe they're taking a step. But we won't know unless we take a step to see if they're there at the halfway point. But I'm scared because I know it's more a problem for a teenager than it is for an adult because we're going to have to be living with it for the rest of our life. I think that, that we delude ourselves when we don't think that we have a problem. And I agree with Dolly that, that when you don't have, when you've got virtually no Negroes in your community, you do have a problem. You're all sitting around as though you cannot do it. And why can't you do it? Everybody is frightened by the first time, and after the first time, it's not nearly so difficult the second time, and the third time it would be easier, and it would just work with all of us. I know it would. But I think that if we are not doing something um, positively and constructively on the basis of this film, then we are not taking a step. Maybe may a weak step, and maybe a faltering step, but I think we should take the first step. But unless some kind of a group is established tonight, I have a feeling this will just have been a rather interesting and controversial evening, but that will be it. And uh, so I would like to suggest that, you know, somebody stand up and do something. <laughs> I've been gratified tonight to hear some of the things that I heard, disappointed to hear some of the others. But what I would like to, to ask all of you right now is uh, to, to go home tonight, think about this, talk it over with your family, and let's, let's really move on this thing. And I'm sure that, that we can move. Now, how we do it will come. We've committed ourselves, I think, already here tonight. And I'm, I'm pleased. It, it, it's time. Let's not burn. I, for one, am willing to serve on such a committee. How many of you would want to get in on something like this? I look forward to uh, some interesting things happening in the very near future. Shall we bow our heads in prayer?
gracious Father. We thank you for this experience which we have had this evening, for your creative presence. We thank you for the willingness of the Augustana congregation to let themselves be seen. For we are well aware of the fact that we have problems here too and that through the medium of this m movie we have been tremendously helped and blessed uh, so that we are ourselves uh, ready to uh, take some definite action and willing to work and talk uh, for the acceptance, the equality, the justice and the rights that all men uh, deserve. Hear us, help us, have mercy upon us. For the sake of Jesus, amen. CBS News has presented A Time for Building. This program was pre-recorded.